first time when the muir men win their hay. The dirty dog was bound him right into England to drive a prey. He chose the gardens and the grounds, the Lindsay's light and Known that the borderlands here were invaded time and time again during the wars of independence with English. The towns and countryside was raised to the ground on numerous occasions. But it's naive to think that we were only victims. The Scots, and particularly us Scots borderers, took revenge on many occasions. And today I'm going to talk about one of those occasions. A story which has drifted from the history books into legend, poetry and even song. But what really happened at the Battle of Otterburn? And is there any evidence on the ground to support this? In 1384, King Richard III of England led 14,000 men into the Scottish borders and almost completely destroyed Dryber Abbey and Melrose Abbey. One man more than any other took great offence at the sacking and desecration of Melrose and Dryber Abbeys. That man was James II Earl of Douglas. There only was really one course of action after this. And that was revenge. James, the second Earl of Douglas, would have been a great nephew to James the Good, the Black Douglas. And he had inherited all of his uncle's warrior-like characteristics. It always astounds me the audacity of these men, the sheer <laughs> foolhardiness, bravery, whatever you want to call it, that they displayed. And these were just normal border guys and you know they took some pretty drastic actions. What are we going to do, Douglas? The English have destroyed our abbeys again, what can we do? Mm. Shall we beg for peace? Shall we hide? Will we make peace with the English? Mm. No. No what? Get a force together, we're going to go down there and wreck the place. Anyway, in 1388, James II Earl of Douglas gathered troops here at South Dean Kirk, just south of Jedburgh, right next to the English border. And this was the muster point for a force which James was going to use to invade England in revenge. The plaque on the church here. which was put on in 1910 commemorates the incident at Sudden Kirk in the year 1388 James Earl of Douglas and the other Scottish leaders assembled their forces, matured their plans and began the invasion of England which culminated in the Battle of Otterburn almost 6,000 men came here to James's battle cry and the ensuing invasion and what happened has became the stuff of legend. Poems, the Battle of Otterburn, the Ballad of the Battle of Otterburn, the Ballad of Chevy Chase and the English side of the story. The Lammas Tide by the Corries. The whole thing has become this romanticised version of events. But what really happened? And what was the toll on both sides of the border? 
but as well as this being an attack for national vengeance or regional vengeance for the attacks on the Scottish borders for Douglas I think it was a bit of a personal attack as well Henry Percy was the leader of the English forces in the North East Hotspur was his nickname he had such a reputation as a gallant and brave warrior also but Douglas wanted to take that reputation for himself he knew Hotspur was hiding or camped out at Newcastle the current day city of Newcastle and that was one of his major targets so off they went south to England Douglas and his army, his army of almost 6,000 men, began to progress through the northern English dales, destroying everything in their path. From Reedsdale to Cockettdale and right down to County Durham, they destroyed everything in their wake. But their main target was waiting at Newcastle. the destruction across much of Northumberland Douglas finally made it to Newcastle some form of hand-to-hand -hand combat ensued between him and Percy and Douglas came out victorious Douglas stole Percy's pennon and taunted him with it saying he was going to fly it from the top of Dalkeith Castle in Scotland when he got back but it was when Douglas's army left Newcastle and began their foray back through England that the real action began. Douglas had defeated Percy in single hand-to-hand -hand combat at Newcastle. But the raid was by no means over. Their first stop was here, Pontyland. Where Pontyland Castle was destroyed, raised to the ground. It was never rebuilt, and now on the site stands the inn over there, the Blackbird. But the humiliation for Percy at Newcastle was too much. He wasn't going to lie back and accept it. He'd mustered together an army now stronger than Douglas's 8,000 men versus Douglas's 6,000 and he was hot on their trail as Douglas retreated back towards Scotland. When Douglas and his men arrived here at Otterburn on their way back to Scotland, they decided to camp for the night. Hotspur and the English army, however, were hot on Douglas's trail. They were desperate to get Hotspur's pennon back and also to take revenge. Remember, Douglas and the Scots army had just laid waste to half a county Durham and Reedsdale, Otterburn, Pontyland and Newcastle as they slept here on that night in August 1388. Hotspur's army attacked. They had the upper hand. They had the element of surprise. Hotspur had massively, massively underestimated the border men and the Scots army. 
because they fought back and they won, they defeated the English. Almost a thousand English men died, hardly any Scotsmen died. Apart from one notable one, and that was James Douglas himself. His prophetic vision from the night before it came true. And he died on the battle scene here at Otterburn. From the poem, The Battle of Otterburn, we learn that Douglas commanded his men to hide his body beneath a tree near the battlefield so the rest of the men wouldn't know he was dead to keep morale high. And that's what they did. He was taken to a bush near the battle site where he died that evening. His body was later returned and interred in Melrose Abbey. This memorial just outside Otterburn marks the spot of the exact site of the Battle of Otterburn that night in 1388 when so many men died. But it's all stories and monuments. Is there any actual evidence on the ground that tells of this slaughter at that night? A few miles down the road from Otterburn is this wonderfully historical town, or village, sorry, of Elsdon. With this magnificent Morton Bailey Castle. I've never seen anything on this scale before. Absolutely vast. And nobody here, not a soul. But it's in Elsdon here that the Battle of Otterburn moves from the pages of novels and poetry, from the writings of Sir Walter Scott or the author of Chevy Chase, and it becomes a brutal and physical reality. This is St Cuthbert's Parish Church in Elsdon, right in the village centre. A church with loads of history associated with it. Not least the fact that St Cuthbert's body is said to have laid here on his travels before he reached Durham. My old friend St Cuthbert crops up in a lot of places. But this is a church which houses a rather gruesome find. And I'm talking even more gruesome than the two stone coffins propped up outside the building. Because in 1851, when this church was being renovated and some of the floor was being dug up, they found a mass grave, a grave containing 900 young male skulls. It's thought that the dead from Waterburn were all brought here and bundled in a mass grave. Plenty of history and stories adjourning the walls of this beautiful church. But I can see nothing, nothing to commemorate the 900 men who were buried here in unmarked graves in 1388 or, or thereabouts. It really brings it home, the horrors of that night at the Battle of Otterburn. Like I say, it becomes a romance, it becomes a, a 
fictional story almost. But when you hear of all these young men lying here with no, no respect, no memory, it really does bring it home. It's very easy to get bogged down with the stories of the desecration of Melrose Abbey and the destruction of the Scottish borders. I feel a bit of self-pity or loathing for the English armies, but, but this was a time of war. We didn't just sit back and take it. We had men like James Douglas, men of fire, men of action, who simply took the war back to the English and the damage down here was just as bad, if not worse, than what happened to us in the borders at some stages, at some stages of the war. Now it fell about the Lammas tide when the Muremen went their hay. James Douglas's body was returned here to Mellows Abbey where it was buried for eternity. But this, this is Douglas's tomb here. Unmarked for Colin. There are some far less men far bigger and better tombs than this. Bit of a travesty if you ask me. Come on, let's get a plaque up at least. But his legend, his legacy, lives on in the ballads of Waterburn. Thank <laughs> you.